Welcome to the IntraZone, a show about the Microsoft 365 Intelligent Internet. I'm Mark Cashman, here with my co-host Chris, who's always running fast and furious, McNulty. Today, we're chatting with Sham Narayan, Principal Group Product Manager at Microsoft on the SharePoint Engineering Team. Sham is all about scale, performance, and reliability of the SharePoint service in Microsoft 365. And we focused our discussion on all the recent service tweaks and innovation he and his team have done to truly optimize SharePoint from a content services platform, which I think is right up Chris's alley. Yeah, if you think about it, you know, rolling back to when SharePoint was exclusively an on-premises offering. The good news is, as an architect and an administrator, you could tweak and configure almost anything. The bad news is you had to tweak and configure almost everything. And with the pivot to cloud, you know, Sham and company are really optimizing a lot of those core backend services and microservices. So database layout, design, architecture, caching, all of those sorts of things. They optimize those, which you can start seeing in capabilities like file open time, page load, synchronization, user experience, you know, responsiveness, all those sorts of things are kind of being baked into the platform. But that doesn't mean that there's no role to op- that you can play in optimizing SharePoint. There's an awful lot of attention that needs to be paid to what makes like good page design, what's good network design. And so you don't have to focus on everything, but I think it would be great today to get our audience a better understanding of what we're doing on our side and what you can do on your side so that collectively we can have just the highest performing experience for our customers. A lot of what I think we will frame as our questions to Sham will hopefully plumb through as the the value of what he and his team do. We talk a lot about the optimization of SharePoint, but a lot of what Chris was just uh, was enumerating through as far as where the performance improvements are actually seen are because we want to have great experiences of all content experiences in Microsoft Teams, in Microsoft Viva, of course, SharePoint itself throughout the internet or when you're doing any team collaboration or when there's no app in, in the sense of the service. You're working maybe directly with content with Office on the desktop. There's so much work around storage and performance, but to Chris's point, there are a lot of things that our customers can do to optimize their own networks to, you know, basically plumb through and hopefully get the most out of the way to optimize the way that Microsoft enables you to connect from your front door all the way through to the service back end. So a couple of terms we thought we just uh, put out there that you're going to hear Sham talk a lot more about is kind of that first mile between the you know the customer or the end user through their own network that eventually will hand off through the internet and then get into our data center. And there's a lot of parts and pieces that Microsoft can do to optimize, but there's also a lot that you can do to optimize. I'm going to mention one AKA link that I think is just really good for anybody out there that's either a network admin or just purely interested in knowing a lot more. This goes a lot broader than SharePoint, but there's SharePoint components there, but it's a pretty easy one to remember. If you go to aka.ms slash tune, T-U-N-E, you'll see a lot of the things that you can optimize or at least awareness of what are some of the things that we're doing to get it so that your experience or you on behalf of your end users can optimize the experience of their productivity of what everything that they do to touch anything across Microsoft 365. Yeah. And it's going to be good to get his perspective on that. If you think about the ways that you had to optimize a globally distributed network before it looks very different now. I mean, and I think it's important. I, you know, I keep going back, Mark, to remember a couple of years ago, you and I went to into an Azure data center to do an episode of the Interzone about what Microsoft's doing in the data center side. And I, I can't emphasize enough that what you think might be happening in the cloud is not what's happening in the cloud. When you connect to your SharePoint environment, to your team's environment in M365, you are not connecting to your server that lives in a rack in a data center down the street. You're connected to 
a series of distributed services and storage backends with a network topology that's designed to bring all of that stuff together from the moment you click, how it gets on the wire into our data centers and how it gets back to you. And in many cases, there's a lot of heritage that you may still have in the physical side that doesn't reflect this kind of elastic communications fabric that lives in the cloud. You know, I'm thinking of one instance before where a customer was reporting really long page load times coming from uh, for users in Australia. And they were connecting to an Australian based implementation of M365. So they weren't understanding why they were seeing like 15, 20 second page loads. And working with them, we were able to find that they still had authentication traffic that was going across their internal network for the whole world to come back to one centralized choke point um, located in the US and then getting routed back across the public internet back into our services. And so the good news is that stuff can be identified and can be optimized before we even get into what's happening on a page. So there's definitely something I want to like lean in with with Sham about what we can do to spotlight that for our customers. I mean, when you say 15 to 20 seconds for a page load, I think, man, there's a long time to wait. And it's also a unfortunate prime opportunity for people to pull the the cord, you know, to, to say, you know what, I can't wait anymore or the next time if it still happens to them. So obviously, any time that either we or you can address getting that down to the milliseconds where it really just is at the speed of thought. Uh, Chris and I wanted to introduce what probably won't stick around for very long beyond this episode, but it's a new acronym. We're going to throw it out there. It's a TTP, which is Time to Productivity. And Chris, I'm going to ask you to put on your when you used to manage and now like you're managing a broad set of people or broader projects that have time spans and, you know, have things that need to get done on a timely fashion. But if there's anything that we can do, like page loads, opening a file, anything to optimize that, and if we can, through our technology, help people with their TTP, their time to productivity, what are your thoughts there if you think, you know, when you when you used to manage the team and now the new team that you're managing, how that would affect if your people are not seeing performance improvements, what does that really do to impact projects and products? To be effective and productive, you want to break things down into smaller components. I know we, we've we spoken with the Loop organization about a component architecture. If you think about that, the advantage of looking at just a single agenda list is I don't have to open up a you know 450 meg PowerPoint file, have it synchronized down to my machine before I can start working with it. I just have this you know small 50K component. It's lightweight, it's optimized. Some of that goes into like your approach on if you're building out pages, whether, you know, even if they're modern, but if you're intending for people to get to them through a browser or through Teams, if you are loading those pages up with lots of extra components, like one page with all of the activity and content and data embedded on it that my team needs isn't as optimal as a much smaller number of things on each page and more pages so we can chunk things up so that when you click that link, visit that page, you're able to be productive immediately by breaking it down into smaller chunks rather than reviewing an entire year's range of activity embedded onto one piece of uh, content. That's just, you know, it's small equals flexible. And we've got tools that can help you combine all those different pieces as you need to, the same way that you have, Mark, think about SharePoint News. You could accomplish essentially the same end result with one master news page that everyone in the company contributes to on a monthly basis. Here's everything the company did. And then on the consumption side, I've got to find that page, load the whole page, scroll down, I don't know how far, use a search to get to the section that I care about. And if I wanted to just look at, for instance, you know, updates to teams for government cloud. I'd have to look at 12 really big articles instead of just being able to look at all the ways that I might just take that single update and combine it. So keeping things small and light allows you to, you know, get it done quickly, but also be much more flexible in the ways that people may consume 
your information um, in ways that are different than it might have looked like when I originally structured it. Yeah, there's a people behavior component. You know, you only have so much of a threshold of time that you're going to get from people reading your content. And no matter what, certainly, no matter how you do it, if there are best practices and patterns to that behavior and, and really giving people what they need, but in a in a smaller chunk, still, the service is going to optimize so that those pages load. If you're going to distribute it across multiple pages or over time, you know, being able to then deliver those uh, and also the creation of them. You don't want to slow down the creators either. And you mentioned Loop kind of at the head of your comment, which is, I just, you got me thinking this new storage component that is effectively powering a ton of different content and different content types throughout Microsoft 365 from documents to pages, to lists, to sites, to, you know, you name it, you know, SharePoint is doing a lot just to optimize that storage component so that people can store larger files so that they can sync faster so that they can get in and out of a document faster. You know, the innovation of SharePoint storage has been years in the making, But it really does now lend itself to being able to do something like Loop, where maybe 10 years ago, you know, it was a little harder to accomplish that componentization. But now to the benefit of we got a great storage component on the back end, and it's really tied to great productivity enhancements. You know, I I think that, you know, the years have shown that in ways that we never anticipated that that SharePoint engine that drives our content platform is so flexible and it's able to be something that powers not just SharePoint, but Teams and Viva and Loop and all of these innovations that we're bringing forward. SharePoint's good for all those on the back end. And I was just you know, hearing you talk about it, and I love the you know, TTP metric. If you think about one of the ways that people get things answered is with search. And you know, I was describing this at the M365 conference that the way that we build information in files and pages means that search acts kind of like a middle school reference librarian. You're looking for, hey, what was the agenda the last time we met? And what search does all too often, and I'm not faulting Microsoft search, this is just endemic to the way you think about search and documents, is you have a question and search comes back like a reference librarian and says, Here's four news articles, five PowerPoints, three Excel files, and 12 Word documents. If you read all of these, you will learn the answer to your questions, which is fine, but I have to go through all of those to figure out where's the answer to what I really am looking forward is just that one piece. And so that's just not flexibility in collaboration, but flexibility in getting back to what I was working on before. And that is definitely something to be mindful of. But also, we should bring in the experts on SharePoint optimization. Let's take the learning pathway you just described, and maybe we'll use the Dewey Decibel system. Not decimal, decibel system. Turn it up loud because you're about to hear Sham Narayan talk a lot more about what he and his team are doing to optimize SharePoint on the back end for your front end experience. So we now have Sham, Sham from our performance team. He has amazing performance here at Microsoft, and he passes that along to you so that you have a much more performant SharePoint environment to work in. So Sham, welcome to the IntraZone. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Sham Narayan. I'm a group product manager on the OneDrive and SharePoint team, uh, working on the core platform uh, of the service, focusing on performance, file storage, and a lot of the real-time collaboration technologies that we have here at Microsoft. And that is what we are here to talk about. We want to pick your brain, and maybe we'll start at the macro level, where if we're talking about SharePoint, there's a lot more to it than just SharePoint optimization. But can you just share, take a moment to talk about the landscape of where we focus and invest into the breadth of what we think of this network infrastructure? Well, absolutely. I think this really needs, we need to go back to the days of on-prem, right? I think we had SharePoint servers racked away down the hall and we had this Ethernet cable running to your desk and you had great SharePoint just down the hall. And with the shift to the cloud, you know, your SharePoint is now distributed across thousands, hundreds and thousands of servers globally. And we have this thing called as the internet in between us and the user. So when we think about the macro uh, aspect of SharePoint Online and OneDrive, we actually think about 
how do we optimize for performance all the way from the end user's machine or the internet all the way into our data centers and into our servers. So we actually look at the entire end-to-end picture, divide it up into smaller chunks, and then attack each chunk so that we're having good performance along the way. Just to give you a quick a quick overview, we the engineering team, the product team looks at the space across like four broad dimensions. We break up the end-to-end picture into four broad dimensions, starting with what we call as the enterprise networking mile. This is essentially from the user's computer all the way to the edge of the enterprise network. Large corporations run complex networks for various reasons, but it's, it definitely has an impact on the end user experience and performance. So we measure that and we have a lot of guidance around how you should set your network up for optimal performance. Then once you escape the gravity of the enterprise network and get onto the internet, and then before you connect into the Microsoft network, we break that space down into what we call as the middle mile. So it's the space, it's the network hop between the edge of your enterprise and just before you enter the Microsoft network. And here we work with a whole bunch of ISPs and network providers, transit providers, to really make sure that uh, the internet connectivity and cross connectivity into the Microsoft network is great. And then we enter into what we call as the Microsoft Global Network or the first mile. So the Microsoft Global Network is a pretty uh, large, wide area network that's plan- that spans the globe. And we've got good connectivity with ISPs and network providers to get traffic into Microsoft. And once we are in the first mile, we've optimized that both from a protocol perspective, from a physical infrastructure perspective, to really handle SharePoint Online traffic on the Microsoft backboard. This is or this is essentially the network that's built out by the Azure team. It's one of, uh, it's built out with high, lots of capacity, super high bandwidth, low latency. It's monitored and operated by a large engineering team here at Microsoft. And it's really where we can influence a lot of how the traffic uh, moves around within the Microsoft network. And then finally, we have what we call as the SharePoint servers or the SharePoint stack. This, these are the servers we run and operate. And how do we op- optimize those servers for handling the various mix of end user traffic that comes, comes along the way? So those are the four aspects, the enterprise mile, the, the middle mile, the Microsoft first mile and the servers themselves. So we actually think about all these spaces and attack each space individually so we can actually drive performance into it. You know, it's interesting to hear you describe that many companies who have long-standing on-premises infrastructure have set up all these complex you know, internal routes and distributions that go office to office. What do comp- companies need to be mindful of if they have that as kind of preset infrastructure when they're interacting with Microsoft cloud services? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. I think uh, that's the traditional hub and spoke approach that a lot of enterprises have invested over the years. And that generally has branch offices all funnel traffic to a central HQ or a central office in a region. And then they break out to the internet where they connect into other internet service, be it Microsoft or other uh, services. And the general premise or the general move with a distributed cloud computing is, hey, we have more pre- points are present distributed globally across the uh, across the, across the globe. And we now have the opportunity for these organizations to break out locally to the internet. So if you're a user, let's say you're a company headquartered in New York, you have a branch office in Seattle, instead of funneling traffic back to New York, you can now, or it's highly recommended that you have the user traffic come out to the internet in Seattle, and then we pick up your traffic locally and opt- route it optimally on the Microsoft backwards. So the general premise is get out to the internet as soon as possible and let Microsoft handle the traffic uh, on our backwards. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I've had similar discussions with network architects and security architects who, you know, have this global web of T1 and T3 lines that they're used to. And You know, when they try to say, we're going to have 100,000 people all over the world, but regardless of whether they're on a mobile device, we want to carry all of their traffic back into our network so we have one dedicated access point that we use to get there. That doesn't sound sound like it's the optimal performance, does it? No, I think... That's the traditional hub and spoke, and it generally has is counterintuitive to performance and to a lot of the traditional networking uh, layouts we see. The biggest challenge here we have is like we've got traffic getting funneled back into a single choke point. 
that choke point we notice in many organizations is the bottom bottleneck for performance because you are not funneling 100,000 users through a single choke point, which in many cases is not built out for that, that kind of capacity. Uh, and we start running into performance problems. So instead of building out a central uh, location, we actually ask users, break out locally. You don't need that much capacity at each region. Use standard or just commercial, just normal internet to get out to the uh, web, and then we take our traffic over from there. So this is a shift in how we are recommending users connect to the cloud. And the biggest driver of that, I've had a lot of conversations with customers, especially with the pandemic, where they were forced to work from home. And we actually kind of got this model for free, but people were just using commercial internet to get onto the internet and access SharePoint Online, the various M365 services. And in many cases, performance was great because we had none of these legacy networks holding back performance. I actually thought, you know, just as a, a Microsoft employee, when we switched over because of the pandemic, I know two things that we had in place that made it a lot easier just to work from anywhere was the fact that we were in the cloud means we we're already accessing our content from that same place. And the fact that that notion of, of you know, piping traffic through, you know, I didn't have to VPN in, I didn't have to, you know, be on campus, I could just be wherever. And it was, I think, to your point, and maybe to Chris's question, too, of taking that new model of multiple nodes. Uh, I know we have different front doors that people can walk through and connect to, but there's also some things that are at the individual layer. And that's where I wanted to get your take a little bit on, you know, some of the things that your team is doing or helping other teams innovate that actually, you know, no matter how you've set up your network, we should talk about that next. Some of those improvements that we see for, for the individual employee. Oh, absolutely. One thing I do want to touch on, I think there are two aspects of it. One is our front door technology, right? like how are we using front doors to funnel traffic? And I do want to touch on that. And then also some of the optimizations we are making at the core storage layer and in the SharePoint stack that allows us to like uh, build end-to-end -end experiences on top of the platform. So here's, here's the premise of our entire networking strategy. It's get users onto the Microsoft network and then use the backbone to play tricks, to optimize traffic, to reuse connections, to really optimize protocols for transfers. Now, the, the Microsoft network is a pretty large network that spans the globe. And what we've got at the peripheries of this network, we have these devices called as front doors. They're basically edge devices that are on ramps onto the Microsoft network. Right? They're deployed really close to the user. You can think of it as the closest piece of Microsoft technology to our end users or closest piece of infrastructure deployed uh, to our users. We take traffic onto our, the Microsoft front door, regardless of where your data is, we connect you to the closest front door using Anycast, and then we blast that traffic on, on the Microsoft backbone through the data center that's hosting your content. So again, this goes back to the conversation we were just having. Getting out to the internet closer will allow us to take your traffic onto the Microsoft network using the front door technology, and then routing it in the most optimal way to the backend uh, data center that's hosting your content. So that's that's one uh, piece of technology to ac acquire traffic. The second one is pure innovations in the storage layer. At the end of the day, there's a lot of file experiences that SharePoint supports and a page, page experiences, list, name it. The key thing we are optimizing over there for, especially when it comes to files, is like, hey, how do we make sure that we're able to funnel files both up and down the wire in the most optimal way? And we've made some pretty uh, significant infrastructure investments over there. One is like working with large files. Like working with large files is becoming more and more common. Like you stream platting uh, onto ODSP, storing recordings in ODSP, users using large files, whether they're media rich PowerPoint files or video files, uh, all of those things go into SharePoint and they're moving it up and down the wire. So we've made a lot of optimization of how we store this content back into our Azure backend. So there's optimizations and how we parallel write these content back into Azure, how we read them back in parallel so, the, so that we're keeping essentially the network full. And then we've made optimizations at the TCP layer to make sure that we're able to send this data down to the user as soon as possible. So there's optimizations along the way uh, that is actually powering the stack to be able to deliver files both up and down at blazing speeds. And this is where I want to throw at Chris because I know he's got a kind of a SharePoint IT background, a lot more than me, but also th in contrast to a lot of what you and your team are doing now, Sham. But Chris, you, can you imagine this world in the cloud? 
you know, kind of in the very old way of doing all content stored in a SQL Server database, maybe even the first in instance of blob storage. You know, this is so far from that. I'd, I'd love to just get your, like, you know, it's been a while since, but. It's funny. I remember a couple of years ago, Mark and I did a podcast from one of the Azure data centers that we're M365 runs. And one thing I found is really helpful for our customers to understand um, some get it and some don't, is that if you could actually put a network trace and look at the infrastructure that lives in the data center, you might see a couple of things that are recognizable, but we also still occasionally get questions from customers who ask, like, how often do you replace the server that I'm running on? Or, mm -hmm. like, can I get a snapshot of the database? And understanding, like, what a stretched redundant, geographically dispersed storage fabric and application architecture looks like, is just very different. It is truly just a cloud, if you think about it, mm -hmm. from their perspective. Yeah, I, I, I can get into, like, it, it's a huge stretch from what we have on brand. Like, just let's take a, a file upload scenario. In the olden days, good old days, we would just uploaded that to a SQL database and called it done. But the blobs would live with the C in the SQL server. Now it it's a pretty completely different game on, on the back end. Let's say you're uploading a file to SharePoint. Behind the scenes, what we're doing as we're streaming the file bits up into SharePoint, we start chunking them into like small pieces. So if, let's say you're uploading a 10 MB document into SharePoint. You actually chunk it into small pieces. Each of those pieces get encrypted individually with this unique key. So we've got like 10 different pieces all encrypted uniquely. And then we dual write them in parallel to multiple data centers. We have to write them to do two data centers that are geographically dispersed within a region so that they're, they're, they're redundant. But we do all of these things completely transparent to the user. They're optimized, we can write them in a performant way so the end user doesn't see it. But they're all done. Once we've gotten acts from both data centers saying, yeah, everything is written and we've done all the checks we need to, we give the user the thumbs up. Uh, and this is this is where the actual fab storage fabric stretched across virtually across multiple data centers comes into play. And on the flip side, when you try to download one of these files, we always go to the closest data center to start downloading the file. For some reason, we're running at scale, and millions of operations running every second. We run into a hiccup. We automatically go to the secondary data center and start fetching the content. Again, the user doesn't see any of these things. It's completely transparent and keep the keep the file download going. So all of this happens underneath the scene, uh, which is where we're able to take advantage of this virtual stretch storage fabric uh, across the Microsoft ecosystem. And if I'm hearing correctly, you know, as we get more and more granular, like the components breaking down to smaller chunks and components, it improves the performance because sometimes you're only fetching the little K of bit that you need or the megabit here or whatever. And whether that's sync or page load or opening and closing a file, but it also increases the security surface layer because if you have access to a document, you're not always accessing it as a singular entity. You know, it is more complex to the point of the benefit to security as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think this is where there are lots of other features that take advantage of these things where they're able to, as a customer, can bring their own key, we take, take their key and actually encrypt all of these blobs as well. And it's pretty fascinating to say when you take a single document, chop it up into multiple pieces, each of those pieces get encrypted individually and then get sprayed around randomly across a data center. It's a huge security win in addition to the performance uh, and the parallelization that we can do. It's also a huge security win. So, Sham, there's a lot that obviously that we're doing to sort of make sure that the customer experience is pre-optimized, that it's always available, that it's performant, and that's, you know, and many of those are things that the customer never gets to see. But there's a lot of things that the customer not only can see, but can do and try on their own. What are some of the things that you've seen that can have the most or least impact on a customer's productivity performance? Yeah, I think it's a great question, Chris. The biggest one, and I think this actually even inspired us to go build something natively into the product, is 
getting connectivity to the cloud or getting connectivity to the Microsoft 365 uh, ecosystem to be rock solid. And we've got a certain set of principles that we want uh, our customers to adhere by when they connect out to the cloud. We have this documented uh, in our, on our sites. Just go look up network connectivity principles and M365. You'll find a bunch of articles. But the, the two key premises are where one is uh, get out to the internet as soon as possible and let Microsoft take your traffic using our front board technology onto the Microsoft backbone. That gives you the best opportunity uh, to have great performance because you're leaving the heavy lifting of network routing to Microsoft. And we're constantly looking at how traffic's coming into the Microsoft network, applying the latest and greatest optimization techniques to really make sure that they're getting uh, the best experience. So l- let me just ask you about that because that's something I've had customers challenge me on too. They want to hang on to the data as long as possible because they think that it's going to be more secure somehow. What steps do we take to make sure that when traffic is moving between our point of egress and the customer across a public internet, that it's still safe? Here's the thing. I think one of the core security postures we have, any traffic moving uh, within between the customer and the Microsoft network, even within the Microsoft network, is all encrypted. It's all encrypted. We're using the latest and greatest SSL technology. Uh, and encryption technology and all content moving between us and the user is secured by that. In addition to that, you can also use Microsoft technologies like the information protection uh, capabilities to further add encryption to really sensitive content to get, add an additional layer of protection on uh, in addition to the standard thing offered by SSL and HTTPS. So content between the services and, and the end user encrypted by default so they give you the, the best protection. And so we are pretty confident that trying to hold on, holding on to data for longer is actually not helping you with any from a security perspective, actually hurting you from a, uh, from a performance perspective. The contents are encrypted, get out to the internet, uh, we will take it over. You know, one of the things that we're seeing, certainly as we moved into the pandemic, there was motions and adjustments that people uh, reviewed, looked into, took action on. You know, the thing that we're now seeing is a lot of framing and talking around hybrid work, people working at the office, at home, a mix of blended meetings and how people work with each other. Is there anything from a network infrastructure or preparing the going back to the office or just in in anything enabling employees to have choice if we frame it around hybrid work that you would say we do specifically in, in your area? So it's actually interesting because we are seeing a trend as we speak to a lot of our customers who are preparing to have their workforces come back and employees come back into the office, into their large campuses for what after two, two years, two and a half years. And we've gotten used to working from home. Like all the, we were forced to ditch the enterprise networking, go out to the internet, uh, not VPN traffic in. We did all the things we would recommend you do for performance. We kind of accelerated all of those things with the pandemic. And now with them, with, employees starting to trickle back into the workspace, there are conversations we're having with a lot of our customers who are concerned about, hey, uh, how should we think about networking? You know, it's been two years since we have had all of all of our users come back to our office and have live uh, meetings and have conference calls all day and start really using the cloud extensively and it's going to stress our network. So a lot of uh, the enterprises we're talking to, we're actually giving them guidance um, on how they should be setting up their network, what they should be looking for. We actually even use a lot of the data that we get from the service telemetry to funnel and feed that back into customers using the M365 Admin Center. So you can go into M365 Admin Center. There's a tab at the top level called as Network Connectivity. It gives you a view of how you're connecting into Microsoft. And there's a bunch of recommendations that we've got based on what we're seeing for your traffic. We'll be like, hey, we're noticing that you're egressing traffic for users from a single location. We recommend you break out locally or we're seeing that you've got proxies in between that are not be, that are Im- impacting performance. We probably should bypass those proxies. Or you're breaking and inspecting RSSL packets, which is causing reliability and performance issues. You should stop doing that and use controls built into the service to give you security guarantees. So there are a lot of these things we are starting to funnel back to customers using the admin center. So that would be a good, this would be a good time 
for customers as they prepare uh, having the employees back on site to start seeing how and give the network a good health check to make sure that they're ready for it as well. I know I think it's interesting, you know, the the part that I'm hearing is it's really good that you talk to customers because you really know what they're trying to accomplish, either things they don't know about that we help them guide them through best practices or things that we just are learning so that we can adjust things, you know, going forward for that best experience. So I'm imagining a lot of that feedback gives you things to think about of what you're planning for the future and not to disclose anything that we aren't yet ready to disclose, but any way you'd frame on what you and your team are thinking, you know, as we go forward? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'll talk about the two big problem space or two big areas that we're spending a lot of brain cycles thinking about uh, and how we address this. Uh, is one is like just talking about people coming back uh, to work, on the hybrid work, remote work, all starting to become more natural and more uh, widespread pervasive is how can we take the learnings from operating a global service, you know, from our users are connecting, seeing the big patterns in connectivity, and then distilling that down into guidance that we can hand out to customers so that they can take advantage and apply to their network. And I think we're at a very interesting inflection point where we had the entire workforce go work from home over the last two years, and now we're seeing them come back. So how, how are we going to settle in? What do we learn from some of the rich data we get from, from usage? And how can we funnel that back to customers is something where we're spending time thinking. And we're quite frankly very excited about how this is going to shake out. So that's one space. The second space is we are in a, the creator economy, if you will. And uh, from a storage perspective and from a files perspective, things are getting bigger. Files are getting bigger. They're getting richer with more media in it, be it PowerPoint file or be it your video file or audio file or animation files, files are getting bigger. So the, the general space where we spend a lot of time thinking about is like, how do we make the user experience of interacting and working with large files uh, be great? All right. Like like how we would say in the, same, in the team, we want the experience of dealing with a large file be the same that you deal with a small file. So how do we give the user uh, the experience or the perception of not getting bogged down by file size? So we think a lot about this across all our app experiences, across all our endpoints. So we can really build user experiences that are agnostic to file size. It's a pretty interesting challenge, but we, think that, but we believe given where we are headed with content creation, uh, this, is a, this is a space where the team's been spending a lot of their brain cycles. Yeah, as I mean, I'm hearing you, you know, share so much about the networking infrastructure, things that people can optimize to get onto the network, and obviously the the protocols and and all the uh, technology that we put in place to make that secure and performant and reliable. Uh, you know, it makes me think there is, you know, to your point about the files getting bigger and bigger, the track record you all have had of keeping pace with our customers so that not only can they upload the, the amount of files and how big those files are, but the other areas of storage to optimize, you know, what it is that SharePoint was 10 or 15 years ago, just the history alone of the storage optimization through on-prem to cloud and now plus plus everything you're doing, to me, that's like a a blog in the making or a webinar just on storage optimization over the years. But the, the important part is it has always been to meet the feedback and requirements of customers in their actual usage of putting you know content into the cloud. Yeah, absolutely. I think we'd, we'd love to do a blog. <laughs> the other thing that I wanted to mention is, you know, I wasn't sure if we'd still be talking about custom navigation elements causing issues or slow loading sites because of some old cruff from classic SharePoint. You know, there's a lot of work that's been in with modern SharePoint and mega menus and, of course, you know, optimizing images as we import them to showcase them when people load for the first time. A lot of that work is what we don't talk a lot about anymore because it's just been a part of that modern journey in the last four or five years. Am I right to say that out loud? You know, the focus is less about SharePoint being optimized and it's more about networking and just distance between and how people connect to the Microsoft 365 cloud. Yeah, I think it's a fair statement that a lot of the traditional problems, with images and structure and all those things, we've seen it, we've addressed it. And a lot of the focus is shifting into global connectivity. How do we store data for efficiency? How do we package them so that we can build these new rich experiences 
uh, it's where a lot of the focus has been. And that's where the customers are pushing us towards, given the experiences they want and need, frankly. So that's where it's been pushing us, uh, pushing us strongly towards. Good, good. Well, you, your team has responded well, as much pushing as our customers can. I think we always respond uh, both at the level of the product, the data centers themselves. And I know your team, you know, does a lot from a security reliability, you know, just the infrastructure across the world for geo distributed companies or even very small companies to have the best offering, you know, literally at their front door. So thank you for keeping that focus and thank you for your time today being on the IntraZone. Thank you, Mark. It was a lot of fun. Sham, thanks a lot for coming in and talking to us. I always learn so much about the service and I'm sure our customers really appreciate your time. And hope to be back some, someday with another edition of performance. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy to have you back anytime. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mark. So, Mark, it's great to think about all the ways that you can optimize SharePoint and M365. I know it's a common topic for folks, not for the least of reasons, being that we have kicked off baseball season here in North America. And usually, the fastest way to get where you're going is a straight line down the base path. In fact, if you stray too far outside of the base paths, you are going to be declared out, which is terrible. Why do I bring this up? Well, we do find as we are moving into uh, spring and summer that it's not just a baseball season that's starting, but it's event season. And unlike what we've seen for the past two years, there's a lot of events that are starting to pop up live around the world. We're just off the M365 conference, but let's take a look at some of the events coming to a city near you. And the first one we have coming up is the AIM conference. Microsoft is an elite diamond sponsor, which sounds very fancy. Um, I'll be keynoting at that event. It is coming up April 27th to 29th in Denver, Colorado. There'll be a pretty large group coming from the Microsoft product teams. And if you are interested in joining us there, please visit our blog. We'll include that in the show notes. I would love to be able to engage you there. Next up for events is the SEF 2022. This is a, an event that was planned to be in person, and it still will be in person, but some of the sessions will be delivered virtually. This is to take place in Sweden on May 4th to the 5th, and some of the people that are, are dialing in virtually from the U.S. are myself, Naomi Moneypenny, Dan Holm, Rebecca Isaacson, who will be local, will be driving one of the keynotes, and James Eccles. So SEF 2022, if you're in Sweden in person, and if you're there, expect to see some of us logging in from the virtual space. And if you want to run 24 hours a day between CEF and other events, there's another event happening the same week, and that is the Microsoft 365 Virtual Marathon. That'll be held entirely online May 4th through 6th. So it's a three-day event happening online, uh, covering the broad range of M365 solutions, Teams, SharePoint, and, you know, all of Viva and everything else that we have across the suite. Uh, the next event is here locally, locally for us that are in the Pacific Northwest. It is the 365 Educon Seattle. That's from May 9th through the 12th. And like I mentioned, in Seattle at the Convention Center, there are a couple of days of workshops. There is a keynote with Jeff Teeper, and we're looking at a ton of breakout sessions. A lot of them are delivered by the community and MVPs, and we'll have a good handful of Microsoft-led sessions as well. Uh, and we are here to save you a little bit of money. So if you use the code Cashman, my last name, uppercase, K-A-S-H-M-A-N, you will save $100. So we hope to see you there. Register today, get involved. And uh, also just a little plug for Chris and I, uh, I am doing a Microsoft Lists workshop in one of the pre-days and Chris is leading a workshop on Viva Topics. Coming up for Build, one of Microsoft's primary conferences focused on developer stories, extensibility, all the ways that you can code things with our platform and a future look at capabilities that are coming to Azure, Power, M365, and the rest. That is coming up May 24th to 26th. It is online, it is free, and it is virtual. Of course, as the year progresses, we expect to see even more great events coming to the calendar. So if there's an event that you know about that you'd like to feature on an upcoming episode of the IntraZone, please write to us and we'd love to take care of it here. 
We want to thank our guest, Sham Narayan, for being on the show and for making our use and your use of the service fast and reliable. We encourage you to check out our show page for links to everything we talked about today and more. Visit us at aka.ms slash the intrazone. Send us your questions, send us your feedback for us, for the SharePoint team, for Sham. We want to make sure you get your questions answered and that you know your feedback is heard. You can reach us via email at theintrazone at microsoft.com or via Twitter at SharePoint, at M. Cashman, and at C. McNulty 2000. Remember to rate, review, and tell all your friends about the show. Follow the show at a Major League Baseball Park or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. We're your hosts, Mark Cashman and Chris McNulty. This has been The Intrazone, a show about the Microsoft 365 fast, lickety-zippity-split-zoom intelligent intranet.